You're listening to Audiology. Support our work on Patreon and be sure to submit your requests for topics in the comments below. On April 18, 1942, during World War II, the United States carried out the Doolittle Raid, also known as the Tokyo Raid. This was a significant event because it marked the first time American forces had attacked the Japanese mainland, specifically Tokyo and other locations on the island of Honshu. The raid didn't cause a lot of physical damage, but it was crucial because it showed that Japan could be reached by American air attacks. This was America's way of responding after Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. It also boosted the spirits of the American people. Lieutenant Colonel James Doolittle planned and led the mission, which is also named after him. It was part of a larger strategy that included a total of six American carrier raids against Japan and Japanese-held areas in early 1942. The plan involved launching 16 B-25B Mitchell medium bombers, without any fighter escorts, from the USS Hornet, an aircraft carrier at sea. Each bomber had a crew of five. Their mission was to hit military and industrial targets before flying onto land in China. On the ground, around 50 people lost their lives and 400 were wounded because of the raid. While the physical damage was modest, the psychological impact was significant. It lifted morale in the United States and caused fear in Japan. It raised questions about the Japanese military's ability to protect the homeland and spurred a thirst for revenge. The raid influenced Japanese Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto to attack Midway Island, which resulted in a critical loss for the Japanese Navy at the Battle of Midway. Sadly, China faced harsh retaliation from Japan, with 250,000 civilians and 70,000 soldiers killed in response to the raid. Out of the 16 bomber crews, 14 eventually returned to American forces or to the United States, though some lives were lost. Japanese forces in China captured eight airmen, and three were executed. Most of the aircraft were lost except for one that landed in the Soviet Union, a country not at war with Japan. Under international law, this crew was detained and their aircraft seized. But about a year later, they were secretly allowed to leave, pretending to escape and they made their way back through Allied territories. Doolittle, who led the raid, feared that losing all his aircraft would end his career in disgrace. Instead, he was hailed as a hero, awarded the Medal of Honor, and promoted directly to Brigadier General, skipping two ranks. Just a couple of weeks after the attack on Pearl Harbor, on December 21, 1941, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt had a meeting at the White House with his military leaders. He made it clear that he wanted Japan to be bombed quickly to lift the spirits of the American people. James Doolittle, who would later plan the famous raid, said in his autobiography that hitting Japan's homeland could create doubt among the Japanese about their leadership and give Americans the morale boost they needed. The idea for this daring raid came from Navy Captain Francis Single Letter S, as in Sierra Lowe, who was responsible for anti-submarine warfare. He thought up the concept on January 10, 1942, after noticing bombers practicing on a runway that was marked like an aircraft carrier's deck. Given the task to plan the actual raid was Doolittle, a renowned test pilot and engineer before the war. Doolittle needed planes that could fly for 2,400 nautical miles, with a 2,000-pound bomb load. The B-25B Mitchell bomber was chosen even though its normal range was only about 1,300 miles. This meant the bombers had to be modified to carry almost twice as much fuel. Doolittle also looked at other aircraft, like the Martin B-26 Marauder, the Douglas B-18 Bolo, and the Douglas B-23 Dragon, but each had issues that made them unsuitable when it came to taking off from a carrier or fitting enough planes on one. Originally, Doolittle thought the bombers could land in Vladivostok, Russia, which would shorten the flight, and the planes would be turned over as part of Lend-Lease. But the Soviets, who had a neutrality agreement with Japan, wouldn't allow it. China, however, through its leader Chiang Kai-shek, agreed to let the planes land, even with the risk of Japanese retaliation. They picked out five airfields for refueling stops so the crews could eventually make it to Chongqing. Typically, bombers like these would have fighter protection against enemy aircraft, but because of the mission's unique nature, the bombers would have to go without fighter escorts. After careful planning, it was decided that the B-25 was the perfect fit for a crucial mission. 
On February 3, 1942, two of these planes successfully took off from the deck of the aircraft carrier USS Hornet at Norfolk. With that success, the mission got a green light, and the 17th Bombardment Group, Medium, known for its expertise with the B-25, was selected to participate. They were the first to fly these bombers, acquiring them all the way back in September 1941, making them the most seasoned B-25 crew around. This group was previously engaged in anti-submarine patrols from Pendleton, Oregon, but quickly moved to South Carolina right after the U.S. entered World War II. At Columbia Army Air Base, they were thought to continue similar patrols, but were actually preparing for a mission to strike Japan. On February 9, 1942, they officially moved to Columbia, and the crews were invited to volunteer for this very dangerous mission, the specifics of which were not disclosed yet. They were reassigned from the 8th Air Force to the 3rd Bomber Command on February 19. The initial plan involved 20 B-25s, so 24 of the group's aircraft were sent to be modified at Mid-Continent Airlines in Minneapolis, where they received intense security courtesy of the 710th Military Police Battalion. Modifications to these B-25Bs included removing the lower gun turret, installing de-icers and anti-icers, reinforcing the fuselage with steel blast plates, removing excess weight, adding extensive additional fuel capacity, and even disguising broomsticks as gun barrels. The bombers were also equipped with a simple and cost-effective makeshift bombsite, dubbed the Mark Twain. By March 1, 1942, 24 chosen crews began picking up these customized bombers, and moved them to Eglin Field in Florida for intense specialized training that lasted three weeks. They practiced simulated carrier deck takeoffs, night flying, low-altitude bombing, and navigating over water, all while operating from a secluded auxiliary field. Lieutenant Henry L. Miller, a Navy flight instructor, guided their takeoff training, eventually earning an honorary place with the Raider Group. Despite weather-related training disruptions, Lieutenant Colonel James Doolittle, the leader of the raid reported that the teams were ready for the task. There were some mishaps. One plane was lost during a landing accident, another was badly damaged, and a third was withdrawn from the mission. On March 25th, the remaining 22 B-25s left for McClellan Field in California, arriving on March 27th for final inspections and modifications. Sixteen bombers eventually moved to Naval Air Station Alameda, California, by March 31st, with one extra plane intended to demonstrate a safe takeoff. However, that extra plane ended up joining the mission fleet. On April 1st, 1942, the USS Hornet loaded up at California's Naval Air Station Alameda with a grand total of 201 crew members from the Army, which included 71 officers and 130 enlisted men, along with 16 specially modified bombers. These bombers weren't ordinary. Each was armed with four 500-pound bombs, three high-explosive and one incendiary, intended to disperse over a large area. There was a twist to five of these bombs. They had Japanese friendship medals tied to them, which were originally given to American servicemen by Japan before tensions escalated into war. To maximize their flying range, these bombers had limited armament, just 2.50 caliber machine guns and 1.30 caliber machine gun. They were strategically positioned on the Hornet's flight deck, ready for their mission. The Hornet, accompanied by Task Force 18, commenced its secretive journey from San Francisco Bay on April 2nd. By the following day, additional parts were delivered by Navy Blimp to finish modifications on the bombers. Soon after, they joined forces with Task Force 16, led by Vice Admiral William F. Halsey, Jr. The task force showcased a mighty lineup, including two aircraft carriers, three heavy cruisers, a light cruiser, eight destroyers, and two fleet oilers, all taking extra precautions by maintaining radio silence. On the afternoon of April 17th, after refueling, the task force moved at high speed towards a point east of Japan, in enemy-controlled waters. But on the morning of April 18th, while they were still a considerable distance from Japan, the task force was spotted by a Japanese patrol boat, which was quickly taken out by the USS Nashville, even as the captain of the boat chose to end his life rather than be captured. In an urgent response, the decision was made for the B-25s to launch immediately, each with a runway of just 467 feet. Despite no pilot having carrier takeoff experience, all the bombers launched successfully. Tracking towards Japan, they managed to avoid detection by flying low, 
and began their bombing runs over Tokyo and other locations by midday, encountering only some resistance. Remarkably, not a single bomber was lost to enemy efforts, with some reports of Japanese fighter planes being downed by American gunners. After the raid, the 15 bombers that remained headed towards China, with one making the call to divert to the Soviet Union due to fuel concerns. And upon reaching China, the crews had to make crash landings or bail out due to fuel scarcity and adverse weather conditions. Captain Edward J. York's aircraft that landed in the Soviet Union faced a different challenge. Since the Soviets were not at war with Japan, they had to intern the crew, a situation that lasted several months until they could make their way into Iran. There, they presented themselves at a British consulate on May 11, 1943, under the guise of a daring escape, details that would later be clarified by Soviet records. Lieutenant Colonel Doolittle and his crew parachuted into China and received help from Chinese civilians and an American missionary named John Birch. In a fortunate turn for Doolittle, his landing spot was serendipitously soft, sparing him further injury. The mission they had completed was an unprecedented one for the B-25 Mitchell bombers, marking it as the longest combat flight they had ever undertaken. After the bombing raid by Jimmy Doolittle on Tokyo, the majority of the American B-25 bomber crews who made it to China were able to reach safety thanks to the courageous assistance of Chinese soldiers and everyday people. Out of the 16 planes and their crews, which totaled 80 men, all except for Captain York and his crew, who safely landed in the Soviet Union, ended up making forced landings or bailing out of their aircraft. In the end, 69 members of the raid managed to avoid being captured or killed. Regrettably, three did lose their lives in action. Showing their appreciation, these American airmen gave what they could to the Chinese who helped them. But this act of kindness came at a high price for the local Chinese, many of whom suffered severe persecution and even execution for aiding the Americans. As a brutal consequence, the Japanese Imperial Army killed an estimated 250,000 Chinese citizens during their search for the raiders. Eight of the raiders were captured, but the full extent of what they went through wasn't known until after the war ended in 1946. Among those who aided the airmen was Irish Bishop Patrick Cleary, who was based in Nanching. As retaliation, Japanese troops burned the entire area down. The fate of the crews from two planes piloted by First Lieutenant Dean E. Hallmark and First Lieutenant William G. Farrow was unclear for some time. These crews totaled ten men. Information was finally received by the United States from the Swiss Consulate General in Shanghai on August 15, 1942, revealing that eight missing crew members were prisoners in Japanese custody in Shanghai. The other two, Bombardier Staff Sergeant William J. Dieter and Flight Engineer Sergeant Donald E. Fitzmorris from Hallmark's plane, had tragically perished when their plane went down. They were later found and buried with honors at Golden Gate National Cemetery. Of the eight men captured, all were sentenced to death in a military trial in China. Later, they were taken to Tokyo, where five of the sentences were reduced, but the remaining three were executed. Of the captured airmen, three were killed by the Japanese, including the executions. The survivors who remained prisoners suffered through poor conditions and faced severe health decline on a starvation diet. In 1943, they were moved to Nanjing, where one of them, First Lieutenant Robert J. Mater, died later that year. The remaining prisoners eventually saw slightly better treatment and were given a Bible and other books. They were liberated by American forces in August 1945. Four Japanese officers responsible for the war crimes against these captives were subsequently tried, found guilty, and sentenced to hard labor. One of the liberated airmen, George Barr, struggled with severe emotional distress upon his return, and it wasn't until Jimmy Doolittle personally intervened that he received adequate care and began to recover. Jacob DeShazer went on to graduate from Seattle Pacific University and returned to Japan as a missionary, dedicating over three decades to service there. The remains of Pharaoh, Hallmark, and Mater, after being recovered post-war, were laid to rest with full military honors at Arlington National Cemetery, while Spatz was buried at the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific. In total, the raid resulted in three crew member deaths in action, while eight became prisoners of war. Of those captured, three were executed, one died while imprisoned, and four returned home. Additionally, seven raiders, including all five of Lawson's crew, needed medical attention for serious injuries. 
Among the surviving prisoners, Barr passed away in 1967, Nielsen in 2007, DeShazer in March 2008, and the last survivor, Height, passed away in March 2015. Converted Right after the raid, Colonel James Doolittle shared with his crew that because they had lost all 16 aircraft and the damage to their targets was relatively minor, he thought their mission hadn't succeeded. He was so convinced of this that he expected to be court-martialed when he got back to the United States. However, contrary to his belief, the raid ended up boosting the spirits of the American people. In recognition of his efforts, not only did Doolittle avoid a court-martial, but he also quickly rose in rank. By April 28th, while still in China, he went straight from lieutenant colonel to brigadier general, skipping over the rank of colonel entirely. President Franklin D. Roosevelt even awarded him the prestigious Medal of Honor in June upon his return. During a visit to Eglin Field in July 1942, alongside commanding officer Colonel Grandison Gardner, Doolittle kept his recent secret training at Eglin under wraps, as even the local newspaper, the Okaloosa News Journal, didn't reveal anything about it. After that, Doolittle took on important roles, leading the 12th Air Force in North Africa, then the 15th in the Mediterranean, and finally the 8th in England over the following three years. Every one of the 80 Raiders received the Distinguished Flying Cross for their bravery. The Chinese government honored them as well. The Raider crew members who were either injured or killed during the mission were awarded Purple Hearts. Two members, Corporal David J. Thatcher and First Lieutenant Thomas R. White, earned silver stars for their heroic efforts helping other crew members evade capture in China. Doolittle also made sure in his autobiography to mention that he insisted every raider get a promotion. Some of the crew members continued their service in the China-Burma-India theater, flying missions for over a year, with five losing their lives in combat. Others returned to the United States and took part in combat in the Mediterranean, with four dying in action and four becoming prisoners of war. Nine served in the European theater, one was killed, and one, David M. Davy Jones, was shot down and imprisoned in the notable prisoner of war camp, Stalag Luft III, where he took part in the famous Great Escape. Tragically, within 15 months of the raid, 12 of the surviving raiders died in various air crashes. Two were discharged from the U.S. Army Air Forces in 1944 due to the severity of their injuries. The 17th Bomb Group, which was where the Doolittle Raiders had originally come from, got new crew members and moved to Barksdale Army Airfield in June 1942. There they switched to flying the Martin B-26 Marauder Medium Bombers. By November of that year, the group was deployed to North Africa and stayed active within the Mediterranean theater with the 12th Air Force until the end of the war. Following an attack, the Japanese Imperial Army launched what's known as the Zhejiang Jiangxi Campaign, or Operation Seigo. The mission was to ensure that these eastern coastal regions of China couldn't be used for further strikes on Japan and to retaliate against the Chinese. The army devastated an area of roughly 20,000 square miles, leaving utter destruction in their wake. Father Wendelin Dunker, an eyewitness, described the scene as, like a swarm of locusts, they left behind nothing but destruction and chaos. During the Japanese pursuit of the Doolittle Raiders, they killed an estimated 10,000 Chinese civilians. Those who had helped the American airmen were subjected to torture before being executed. Father Dunker detailed the horrors inflicted upon the town of Ihuang, where the Japanese forces shot indiscriminately and committed widespread rape before looting and burning the town. When Japanese troops entered Nanchung, a city with a population of 50,000, they initiated what missionaries later called the Rape of Nanchung, a brutal campaign that reminded many of the earlier tragedy in Nanjing. After less than a month, the Japanese set fire to what remained of Nanchung, with one Chinese newspaper reporting that the city was reduced to charred earth over three days, as the Japanese withdrew from the Zhejiang and Jiangxi regions by mid-August, they left a legacy of ruin. Chinese sources estimate that 250,000 civilians were killed. In their campaign, the Japanese army also spread infectious diseases like cholera, typhoid, plague, and dysentery. Unit 731 of the Japanese military was responsible for bringing in and deploying biological weapons, including paratyphoid and anthrax, contaminating food and water supplies, inadvertently affecting their own troops. About 1,700 Japanese soldiers died out of 10,000 who fell ill. The commander responsible for the Japanese forces, Shunroku Hata, was brought to justice after the war.
In 1948, he received a life sentence, partly because of his inability to prevent such atrocities, although he was paroled six years later in 1954. Doolittle shared in his autobiography that he originally thought the mission was a failure and that he might be demoted when he got back to the United States. However, the mission ended up proving that taking off in a B-25 from an aircraft carrier was actually easier than we thought. It also showed us that night operations could be possible in the future. We learned that the tactic of shuttle bombing, which means planes take off and land at different bases, works well with carriers because they do not need to wait for planes to return. The American pilots had to use their parachutes unexpectedly because there were no lights on the ground to guide them for a landing. The staff at the Chinese airfield said they were surprised by the early arrival of the B-25s. They had turned off the homing beacons and runway torchlights because of concerns about Japanese planes attacking, which had happened previously. Now, if Claire Lee Cheneau had been aware of the mission details, it could have gone much smoother for the Americans. Chenol had established an excellent air watch system in China that could have alerted the airfield crews about the raiders' arrival. It also could have confirmed the absence of any Japanese attack threat, allowing for the landing lights to be switched on for a safe landing. Chiang Kai-shek, recognizing the value of what the raiders accomplished, awarded them China's highest military honors. In his diary, he anticipated that Japan would be forced to alter its objectives and strategies due to the humiliation they experienced. And he was correct. The raid significantly unsettled the Japanese Imperial General Headquarters. As a direct consequence, Japan targeted territories in China to prevent further shuttle bombing runs. They also redirected a significant portion of their Air Force resources from offensive operations to defense of their home islands. They even initiated the Aleutian Islands campaign to prevent the U.S. from using those islands as a base for bombing Japan. This resulted in the diversion of two carriers that would have otherwise participated in the Battle of Midway. Thus, the most significant victory from the raid was that it compelled the Japanese to overextend themselves and make strategic miscalculations out of fear for the remainder of the war. Mitsuo Fuchida and Shigeyoshi Miwa expressed admiration for the one-way raid, describing it as an excellent strategy because the bombers flew in much lower than anticipated, evading army fighters. Kuroshima acknowledged that the raid caused deep concern in Japan, and Miwa called out the army for falsely claiming to have shot down nine planes when in reality they had not downed a single one. Let's talk about an event from World War II you might find quite interesting. The Doolittle Raid. This was an attack on Japan by the United States, which, while it did not cause enormous damage, certainly left an impression. The raid only caused minor damage, which the Japanese were able to repair quickly. Early reports mentioned that 12 people were killed and over 100 injured. There were 13 targets hit, including oil tanks, a steel mill, power plants in Tokyo, and a nearly finished aircraft carrier in Yokosuka, which delayed its deployment until November. The attack also had unintended casualties, such as six schools and an army hospital. Japanese officials noted that the two captured aircraft had indeed hit their intended marks. Speaking of being captured, Allied staff, including ambassadors in Tokyo, had been detained until plans were made for their return, which happened through the neutral port of Lorenzo Marques in Portuguese East Africa in the middle of 1942. An interesting anecdote is that the then United States ambassador, Joseph Grew, initially mistook the American planes for Japanese ones and thought they might have come from the Aleutian Islands. The Japanese media incorrectly claimed that nine planes were shot down, even though there were no photos to prove this. The embassy staff from Allied countries were delighted by the raid, with celebrations and toasts in honor of the American flyers. Sir Robert Craigie, the British ambassador who was under house arrest, remarked that the Japanese used to find their air raid precautions amusing, but now the mood had shifted to one of excitement and anxiety. This atmosphere even led to a loss of the usual composure among people, especially in less affluent areas and increased precautions were taken around international missions to prevent any revenge attacks. This raid, minor as the physical damage may have been, was a big morale booster for America, which was still recovering from Pearl Harbor and the rapid Japanese territorial expansions. Initially, the Japanese press framed the attack as a heartless bombing of civilians, but the truth about the casualties emerged after the war, revealing 87 dead, 151 seriously injured, and over 300 with minor injuries. 
In a counter move, the Japanese Navy tried but failed to chase down the American force responsible for the attack. The best of the Japanese fleet, including five carriers, was immediately sent to find and destroy the United States carriers, but missed them, as the American fleet had already headed back towards Hawaii. The Japanese commanders, especially after learning that the attack was carried out by bombers that were typically land-based, were thrown off and realized their own vulnerability to air attacks. This spurred the Imperial Japanese Navy to take more aggressive action, which, unfortunately for them, resulted in a significant loss at the Battle of Midway weeks later. The goal of the Doolittle Raid was for both material and psychological impact, to hit specific targets and slow down production and to instill fear, prompting Japan to redirect resources back home for defense. This, in theory, would ease the pressure on other theaters of war, boost relations with allies, and lift American spirits. There were also practical concerns following the raid. The United States was worried about the defense of their west coast, prompting conversations about potential threats and even reaching out to Mexico as a precaution. Lastly, there is a quirky tidbit about the aftermath of the raid. In an effort to keep the launch point of the attack a secret, President Roosevelt told a reporter that the planes had taken off from Shangri-La, a fictional place from a popular novel of the time. It was not until a year later that the public learned the truth. The Navy even went on to name an aircraft carrier the USS Shangri-La in 1944 to honor the raid, with Doolittle's wife Josephine christening it. Every year since the late 1940s, the Doolittle Raiders gathered almost annually to honor those among them who had passed away. In a private and solemn ceremony, they would call out the names of their fallen comrades and drink a toast from uniquely engraved silver goblets, each representing one of the 80 original Raiders. For those who had died, their goblets were turned upside down. The names on the goblets were inscribed so they could be read from either direction. Together, they shared a toast with a special bottle of cognac that traveled with them to their reunions. In 2013, the Raiders decided to have their final public gathering in Fort Walton Beach, Florida, near the base where they had trained for their historic mission. Before 2006, the Air Force Academy displayed the goblets and cognac bottle, but they were later moved to the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Ohio. Sadly, on April 18, 2013, at Eglin Air Force Base, one of the survivors, Robert Height, couldn't make it to what would be their last reunion. The final tribute to their brothers-in-arms occurred on November 9, 2013, at this museum, complete with a B-25 flyover, and was attended by Raiders Richard Cole, Edward Saylor, and David Thatcher. Seven individuals, including Lieutenant Miller and historian Colonel Carol V. Glines, are recognized as honorary members for their contributions. To keep the legacy alive, the descendants established the children of the Doolittle Raiders organization, which continues to hold reunions and raise scholarship funds. Our last veterans, Colonel Bill Bauer, Lieutenant Colonel Edward Saylor, Lieutenant Colonel Robert L. Height, Staff Sergeant David J. Thatcher, and Lieutenant Colonel Richard E. Cole, each left us in the years following the beginning of the reunions, carrying with them the extraordinary stories of their service. Lieutenant Colonel Cole, notably, outlived even James Doolittle himself, and was the final raider alive when the USS Hornet was located in 2019, passing away later that year at the age of 103. At the National Museum of the United States Air Force, a vast collection of Doolittle raid artifacts tells the story of this daring bombing run on Tokyo including a B-25 bomber signed by Doolittle's crew. The Air Force Armament Museum and the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum also hold significant pieces of this history. Doolittle's legacy extends to highways named in their honor, memorials in China, and the 1942 exhibit at the Pacific Aviation Museum in Hawaii. The Raiders were commemorated again in 1992 when two B-25 bombers took off from the USS Ranger in a tribute reenactment. They were part of an event that concluded with a low pass and a drop of flowers into the ocean, as General Doolittle and his son looked on. Recognizing their bravery and service, the Doolittle Raiders were awarded the Congressional Gold Medal in 2015. This medal represents their incredible heroism and contribution to the United States during World War II. The Raiders are honored through the naming of the Northrop Grumman B-21 long-range bomber, aptly christened Raider. The last surviving Doolittle Raider, Lieutenant Colonel Richard E. Cole, had the honor of being present at this ceremony. 
The connection between the original Raiders and this modern aircraft lies in their long-range capabilities, a nod to the incredible distance the Doolittle Raiders flew on their mission. Thanks for watching. Share your thoughts in the comments and subscribe for more content.